Thanks, everyone. That first panel is a tough act to follow, even if Jeff hadn't described us as bad news. Here comes the next panel. Uh, but actually, the first panel was a great setup because we're moving from talking about some of the things in the real world of sports to daily sports fantasy. And we're also going to talk about the intersection of that uh, with the real world of sports. And our panel is going to address the legal view. You'll be hearing a little bit later the business view, the legislative view. So we're going to talk about the legal view, and we're going to try to set this all up for you, give you a framework. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. Um, so starting with David Apple down there, David is at Goodwin Proctor. He's a former federal prosecutor. Uh, he is the head of the firm's gambling um, uh, practice group, and he also uh, represents the DraftKings. Adam Berger is next to him from Dwayne Morris. He's active in the firm's gaming law practice. Uh, he represents casinos and, and uh, gaming equipment uh, man uh, manufacturers, and he uh, represents FanDuel. Um, next to him is Zane Memiger. Zane is the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, our leading federal prosecutor. He's also one of my former partners. Zane is on a number of uh, task forces and committees with the government, including, including the AG Advisory Committee. And then next, uh, Sean, pronounce your last name for me. Sansevieri. Okay, Sean Sansevieri is the Vice President of Business and Legal for the NFL Players Association. Uh, he's very active with all of their licensing and sponsorship activities and is very directly involved in the issues related to daily fantasy sports. So we're going to kick this off by trying to give you a sense of where we are in the law, what the legal framework is, and, and Adam's going to kick us off talking about where we are from the state side, and then Zane will fill in uh, the federal picture, and then we'll move on to sort of what the current landscape looks like, and then how it intersects with uh, the, the various associations and uh, actual sports. So Adam? Thank you, Jamie. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here, 2010 graduate. Um, so the key issue with daily fantasy sports, if you've been following it on the news, is whether this is legal or not. And that ultimately comes down to a question of, is it gambling or is it not gambling? Gambling law in this country you have to look at from the federal perspective, then also from the state perspective. I'll briefly touch on federal law, but I'll allow Zaina as the expert to really cover that topic. But there was a federal law um, called the Unlawful Internet Gaming Enforcement Act, which was adopted in 2006, which made it illegal for banks and other financial institutions to process payments related to unlawful internet gambling. That law created an exemption, though, for fantasy sports. So that's been one of the areas where, at least under federal law, the daily fantasy sports companies have been able to claim that their offering is, is um, permissible. But the real issue um, of legality really goes on a state law basis. And states define gambling um, uniquely in all 50 states. And there's no one common definition. States generally determine that gambling is illegal, but exempt certain types of activity. For example, casino gambling, lotteries, horse racing um, would be considered permissible gambling. Fantasy sports, generally speaking, is not into one of those caveats. So if fantasy sports is considered gambling, it will be considered illegal. So the question then becomes, what is gambling? Very broadly speaking, states usually use a three-prong approach. Three prongs are consideration, chance, and prize. So that means if you pay money or something of value for the opportunity to win a prize, and whether you win or lose is dependent on chance, you've then engaged in gambling. In the fantasy sports context, players play an entry fee, so consideration is met, and there's prizes at the end um, for the winners of the contest, so that element's met. So the question is, is daily fantasy sports a game of chance? If not, is it a game of skill? Like anything, the states don't have one unique test for what is a game of chance. The, generally speaking, there's four tests that states broadly use. The first test would be the any chance test. And that means if there's any level of chance at all involved, you have a game of chance. I like to think of it as a golf hole in one contest. 
you know, if you've ever played golf um, and you're trying to get a hole-in-one on a par three, you know that if you're not skilled at all, you're not going to be able to do it. And it takes, you know, the most skilled person to be able to get that hole-in-one. But even that great golfer, you know, maybe needs that slight element of luck, that little gust of wind, their ball lands not on a divot on the green. And in any chance taste, and in any chance state, that would be considered um, a game of chance, even though skill, you know, far um, out dominates um, the level of chance involved. The next test used is the material element test, which is used by a large number of states. In this test, it says if chance plays a material element in the outcome of a contest, then you have a contest of chance, even if the amount of skill outweighs the amount of chance involved. You know, a good example of this, a state that uses it would be New Jersey. And if, several years ago, they analyzed a game of backgammon. And the court who analyzed that determined that even though the most skilled backgammon players win most of the time based on their strategy, because there's a roll of the dice at the start of every game, that chant, that roll of the dice was material, that level of chance was material, and found that backgammon was a game of chance and ultimately gambling. The next test, um, which is used by, an, again, a great number of states, is a dominant factor, also known as the predominant factor test. This test says if skill dominates over chance, you have a game of skill and not a game of chance, and therefore not gambling. In the fantasy sports context, if you follow the news at all, you'll see that skilled players are able to use their knowledge, their strategy, their statistical ability to dominate over the less, um, less skilled players, for lack of a better word. So the dominant factor test is a very favorable test to, to fantasy sports companies. And then the final test for a game of chance, which is used in a very small minority of states, says it doesn't matter if it's chance or skill. If you... Um, if you risk money for a chance to win a prize on a game of chance or skill, gambling is present. So obviously that is a very, very tough test for daily fantasy sports companies to uh, overcome. One of the um, things that I think daily fantasy sports companies focus on is the amount of skill involved, regardless of what test is used. Again, players in daily fantasy contests are able to study teams, they're able to study players, study their players' opponents, and most importantly, they're able to look at the salary cap and the salary cap value assessed to players. And it's that collective skill that will determine whether or not they're successful in a game, um, in a fantasy contest. And also, people who are opponents of this and say fantasy really is a game of chance will often say, well, what about things that players can account for? Weather, injuries. And the skilled player in fantasy sports will argue that that is skill because they can look into a player's injury history. They analyze weather conditions, whether if it's going to be windy, if it's going to rain, how that may affect a particular, a particular player playing a game. I know I'm sort of running up on my, against my uh, time for the brief analysis, so I'll hand it over to, uh, yeah, to David. Yeah, we're going to go to Zane first. Oh, Zane, uh, Zane's going to talk about sort of the federal piece of this because, as Ashley just said, this is generally sort of state-regulated. You're going to hear a lot about that on a later panel. But apart from the regulatory or the legislative aspect, how about the legal aspect on the federal side, Zane? Yeah. Uh, it's, well, first off, it's a pleasure being here uh, this morning. And from really the federal perspective, as Adam noted, a lot of gambling regulation and legislation is dealt with at the state level. But the federal government has really gotten involved um, with gambling enforcement, really from the perspective back with regard to organized crime. That was kind of the driving force of why the federal government got involved um, in terms of enforcement. And so if you look a little bit about the history of the statutes that have come into play, that more or less sort of gives you an example of like why we're here. We're concerned about sort of the violence that's associated with collection of unlawful debts. You've got the bookmakers who are running the operations. You've got the gamblers who are making bets and whether or not people are going out, smashing fingers, breaking kneecaps in order to collect debts, things of that nature. You're concerned about the fixing of real-time sporting events. Um, 
which gets back into fantasy league as to whether or not that could be considered a real-time sporting event or not. Um, you have victimization of minors and compulsive gamblers, and then you have the money laundering activity where you have a legal activity that's being floated, flowed through financial institutions in order to conceal the illegal activity or to make the money clean so that it can be utilized for other purposes. So like in 1961, you had two statutes put into place that except where sports betting was legalized, it was unlawful uh, use a wire transmission to transmit wage information. And it was also unlawful to transmit paraphernalia, writings, tickets, betting slips, things of that nature. You move to 1970, and that's when the RICO statutes get put into place. So it's unlawful to engage in a pattern, a racketeering activity, or the collection of unlawful debts. You've got the illegal gambling business, Section 1955, that gets put into place during that period of time as well. You follow that up in 1986, you get the money laundering statutes that are put into place. And then in 1992, um, the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act goes into place. And with the exception, I think, of Nevada, Montana, Oregon, and one other state that slips my mind at the moment. Um, Basically, what that did was it made it unlawful for either government entities or persons to authorize sports betting. And you move forward, the Internet in comes into existence, and Adam alluded to this a little bit earlier, but you have the UGA, which makes it unlawful to process payments with regard to illegal gambling operations, but it also contains the exception for fantasy sports, um, which in the view of the statute isn't tied to sort of real world timing, real world sporting activity in the sense that you have an actual competition going on and you're making a better wager on that activity. Really what you're doing is you're taking the players that are Involved in that sporting activity and creating a fictional league, a fictional team in which you're measuring their performance and you get points, et cetera, and you can possibly win a prize. And so there's that exception that's contained in those statutes. So when you look at what the federal government's doing right now in terms of the type of cases that we're doing, we're really more focused in on real-time sports betting. We've done cases here in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. There's recently one up in Manhattan, one out in the District of Oklahoma, where you had these large organizations where they're taking bets with regard to real-time sports betting operations and making billions and millions of dollars, and we enforce the laws in that context. So right now, we're really, from the Department of Justice's perspective, waiting to see what the states are going to do with fantasy sports in terms of whether or not it is truly a game of skill or a game of chance and something that they're going to regulate and make unlawful, which will then tie into whether or not there's going to be federal enforcement with regard to illegal gambling activity. That tees up David's comments. David's going to talk to us about where we are sort of today. Um, many of you are probably aware that there's been a lot of uh, news activity, legislation, litigation sort of surrounding this issue. So David, bring us up to speed with where things stand as of now. Uh, good morning, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Um, there's an old expression, a fish doesn't know that it's wet. Um, and the the I mentioned the expression because you can't really understand the current state of play of daily fantasy sports unless you understand the contrast where we were not so long ago. Daily fantasy sports has been around since 2008. Uh, FanDuel was launched in 2009, had games up and running in 2009. 2012, DraftKings started had games up and running in 2012. Um, but as of October 1, as of October 1 of 2015, there was virtually no activity in the daily fantasy sports legal arena. That has changed dramatically over the course of these past six months. Let me give you a couple of comparisons. So for instance, um, 
back on October 1 of last year, FanDuel and DraftKings played their games, um, promoted their contests in all but five states. Uh, today, they, they have blacked out the contests in nine states, and uh, FanDuel's about to black out the contest in a 10th state starting at the beginning of May, the state being Texas. Uh, there were no AG opinions, no attorney general opinions, up or down with regard to daily fantasy sports as of October 1 of last year. Now there are 11 formal opinions from AG's offices around the country and one quasi opinion or indirect opinion from the Attorney General in Massachusetts. 10 of those opinions have found daily fantasy sports to be unlawful in the particular states in which the opinions have been issued. Only one state, only Rhode Island's Attorney General, has formally found that daily fantasy sports, DFS, doesn't run afoul of Rhode Island law. And the Massachusetts Attorney General has implicitly found daily fantasy sports to be legal by promulgating regulations for daily fantasy. Obviously, if you haven't concluded, at least implicitly, that the sport or that the games are lawful under state law, one wouldn't be promulgating regulations to protect the consumer with regard to these otherwise lawful activities. Um, other ways in which there have been changes is there were, there were about 10 states as of October 1 that were looking at legislation in one way or another with respect to fantasy sports. None that were really looking at legislation specifically with regard to daily fantasy sports. Now there are approximately 30 different state legislatures that in one way or another are examining or looking into DFS and whether it's legal. Uh, there, were no there was no litigation involving daily fantasy sports and any governmental entities as of October 1. Today, with the exception of New York, which we'll come back to in a second, there have been, there have been three pieces of litigation in three major states involving daily fantasy sports. New York, Illinois, and Texas. Illinois and te in Texas is pending, and New York there is a, there's, there's more an armistice than there is a settlement, and we'll talk about the details of that in a moment. Uh, perhaps the biggest way in which there has, I was, I was very pleased to hear Zane say that um, he doesn't see a, a, a means of prosecuting daily fancy sports under federal law, and I hope other federal prosecutors have the same view. There have been reports that there are investigations going on in other U.S. attorney's offices around the country, and our, our hope and expectation is that those will come to naught. But uh, although your office is not looking at DFS, the Southern District of New York, it's at least reported, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston, as well as the Middle District of Florida, the Tampa office, is looking at daily fantasy sports. At least that's, those are reports. And perhaps the most vivid way in which we can see a change in the landscape over these past six months is by looking at class actions. As of, as of October 1 of last year, just taking DraftKings as an example, there were six class actions pending against DraftKings, none of which challenged the actual legality of the sport. All of them had to do in one form or another with a species of false advertising. Uh, today, DraftKings has over 130, 130 class actions that have been brought against it, almost all of which, obviously almost all of which, have started in the Past six months. So the question is, what's changed? What, what caused this? And I think that uh, that's a long discussion. 
but the, the quick answer, at least the two things that come to mind that really have made a difference over these last six months, one is what got a lot of, a lot of play at the beginning of October, starting around October 5th, was the so-called insider trading scandal. And the insider trading scandal was, occurred when a DraftKings, a middle-level DraftKings employee, a kid, na a kid, really a kid named Ethan Haskell, uh, came in second place. He was a DraftKings employee, came in second place in FanDuel's million-dollar maker NFL fantasy contest and won $350,000 as a result. Um, there were allegations that he had taken advantage of information, non-public material information from DraftKings to actually form, form his team and make his entry into the FanDuel game. It turned out he, it, he had not used any information from DraftKings in putting in his lineup for the million dollar maker. As everyone knows, perception is way more than half of reality. And in this case, perception took on a life of its own. And the insider trading scandal immediately led to um, plaintiff's lawyers circling in the water, smelling blood, and bringing class action lawsuits alleging fraud of one sort or another. It also led to the New York Attorney General's action, which has also gotten a lot of play. The other thing that I think has made a huge difference and that has led to the dramatic change in landscape that we've seen over these past six months is the incredible advertising blitz um, that, the, that, that both DraftKings and FanDuel put on at the beginning of the NFL season. I mean, all of you will remember that it was impossible to turn on television, to listen to the radio, to walk down the street without hearing or seeing either a DraftKings or FanDuel um, advertisement. They spent literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on advertising, and there was more advertising for DFS in September and October um, than I think for any other product or any other industry in the, in the country. And that was a way, effectively, of leading with their chin. They were putting themselves out there, announcing themselves to be, quote, in the big leagues. And prosecutors' offices, AG's offices, started paying attention in a way that they had started paying attention previously. Uh, Jamie, am I out of time, or can I say? Well, let's just, let's just pause for a minute, because I want to come back to you on the, the settlement and some of those and other where issues. We're, where we're going. And where we're going. But Fine. first, I want to get Sean in from the perspective of the professional sports associations, their involvement, their position, you know, what role you play in this area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me see if I can figure this thing out like everybody else. Uh, and you guys thought uh, I couldn't get excited after star athletes and agents, right? Um, first, I'm really happy to be back here. I'm an 08 grad, so thank you for having me. And, uh, and I'm honored to share uh, the stage with a, a, a panel that really has some really deep knowledge in this area. Um, our interaction, the players associations, and how we fit in is sort of on two levels. Uh, number one, uh, most of the sports unions, all the sports unions are the uh, federal labor law, the exclusive bargaining representative of the players. So we interact with the league and league policy, which obviously follows law, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, also, most of the sports unions have a for-profit subsidiary that does uh, marketing, licensing, sponsorship on behalf of players, in our case, NFL players. Uh, and through that subsidiary, we've negotiated licensing deals with DraftKings and FanDuel. So taking a step back onto the, the union side, uh, the leagues promulgate uh, typically unilaterally uh, player policies that serve to give notice to players uh, of what the commissioners, the respective commissioners, think is conduct detrimental. Uh, an example of that is the gambling policy. Um, the gambling policies in the respective leagues right now actually actively carve out fantasy. Um, they don't specifically speak to daily fantasy, but they do carve out fantasy, and we actively license group player rights, for instance, to the league uh, for use in, in the general fantasy. 
Um, in that gambling policy, it says that uh, players cannot participate in fantasy games when it's pay to play or there are cash prizes. Uh, it says nothing about endorsements, and I think saying nothing about endorsements actually says a lot. And actively, we have a number of players who are, are endorsers, um, both through our uh, deals with uh, FanDuel and DraftKings, and individually as well. So from the, the top level standpoint um, of how we ultimately fit in, we're constantly following the law to make sure that um, all of our deals comply with that. Um, if there is a change on the state level, we build in flexibility so much um, that we can stop operating, stop having endorsers in those various states and jurisdictions if the league policy on gambling changes so that daily uh, fantasy becomes or is considered gambling, then ultimately we'd be able to adjust that uh, as well. There's a perception that there's a difference among the different professional sports uh, organizations in how they look at this issue. W what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I think there is a difference in the, in the way the leagues look at gambling, but not as big of a difference as the way um, leagues look at uh, daily fantasy. I think um, all the leagues are pretty clear, um, at le whether on the team level or on the league level, in saying that uh, daily, daily fantasy is not gambling. Um, and most of the players across the leagues are allowed to endorse daily fantasy. However, the, the gambling policies differ slightly in the way that players can participate uh, themselves in daily fantasy. Um, the NFL specifically says guys can't play in pay to play or with cash prizes. Um, others just bar straight up participation in your own sport uh, when it's pay to play and cash prizes as well. So very similar. Okay, so let's go back David to um, sort of where we are now and talk about where we think we're going, and then you know invite the other panelists to participate in that discussion from their perspective. But take us back to the current. I think you just described it as an armistice or truce or whatever, sure. whatever it is uh, that's getting the highest profile attention. And then let's talk about what comes next. Okay. So let, let me um, let me give you a little sense. This is just it's just me talking. I'm not talking as DraftKings lawyer, I'm just sort of thinking, thinking about how I see the future in this industry over the course of the next two to three years. Um, I think that what we've seen, what, what we've seen over the last six months, if you compare the beginning of the NFL season to the end of the NFL season, we went from <clears throat> We went from a blitzkrieg of advertisements for DFS to DFS being gone, absent. I mean, it's disappeared. There are no advertisements whatsoever. Um, we've gone from daily fantasy sports being in your face all the time to daily fantasy sports being in the news occasionally, but not there all the time. And I think that is really a metaphor for where we're going. We're going from a period of litigation to a period of legislation. And there's going to be a transition where the, the real activity is at the state level in the legislatures. And I believe the recent deal that was cut between the New York Attorney General's office and DraftKings and FanDuel really is, is, is sort of emblematic of where I think much of the activity is going to be headed. So let me, let me give you a quick summary of this settlement. It's not a settlement. I mean, on its face, you can, call it up on the, on, you, can, you can call it up and get a copy of it on the web. It's called a provisional settlement, and it very much is provisional. Uh, it is, it's a truce, it's, it's, it's a peace, it's armistice between the, between the two sides. Uh, as most of you probably know, a trial court in New York issued a preliminary injunction against DraftKings and FanDuel to preclude them from doing business in New York in, a, in early November. Um, uh, DraftKings and FanDuel immediately got a stay of that order from an appeals court and continued to do business. Uh, and meanwhile, appealed the judge's preliminary injunction ruling. As a, the, the case was, was going to be on for argument uh, 
before the Intermediate Court of Appeals in New York uh, in the May term, which starts on April 18th and ends approximately a month later on May 24th. As a result of the armistice, what's happened is that the case has been put on hold. Everything, all argument has been pushed off until September at the earliest. DraftKings and FanDuel have agreed to stop doing business in New York, and they stopped doing business immediately after the settlement just about 10 days ago. Uh, the Attorney General has given up or agreed provisionally to give up all of the claims, including prospective criminal claims, claims seeking restitution, disgorgement in the, in the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, only reserving a false advertising claim or false advertising claims that, that exist. And there's, they're now gonna wait and see um, what happens with the state legislature. And June 30th has become a magic date in the provisional settlement. Because if legislation passes in New York, legislation that authorizes fantasy sports, and there's an expectation that that may well happen, if that legislation passes in New York by June 30th, then the lawsuit is over, DraftKings and FanDuel are back in business in, um, in, in New York, and the only claim that the Attorney General has is the false claims, is the false, uh, is the false advertising claim. If, the, if there's no legislation by June 30, then the litigation continues. And if the Attorney General wins on the appeal, meanwhile DraftKings and FanDuel cannot do business in, in New York, but they wait and see what happens with the appeal. If the Attorney General wins, the case is over. Um, the Attorney General can only pursue his false advertising claim. Uh, DraftKings and FanDuel are out of business, but again, they have protected themselves against the downside of potential criminal exposure as well as massive disgorgement and restitution exposure on the civil side. If DraftKings and FanDuel win, on the other hand, in the appeal, then all bets are off. And effectively, the parties are back to square one, although there is an agreement in the provisional settlement agreement that if the appeal goes forward and DraftKings and FanDuel win, then the parties, the parties shall continue to negotiate in good faith but they're not bound to do anything one way or another. So everything could be back on the table. Yeah, and of course the interesting part about this being dominantly a state issue is there are respects in which what happens in New York doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what happens in some other states. And Adam, when you talked about those four different categories, what category was New York in? New York followed the material element test, so it's interesting that the court would have to actually adopt a real standard and define what a material element is. Um, New York to date, there's not been real clear guidance on exactly what that means. So if this case um, had gone forward, the court would have been forced to make that decision. Now that probably would have affected other states' determinations, but of course it would not be binding on it. Um, I think David made a really great point that moving forward, um, this has become very much a state legislative play. And I think the industry, um, the major players, and even the smaller players in the industry recognize after the insider trading, trading scandal that they were a growing industry. Their companies grew in a period of eight years in the case of FanDuel, um, three, four years in the case of DraftKings, into these behemoths that have billion dollar valuations. And they needed, and they recognized that regulation was a good thing. They embraced regulation. But they said, regulation needs to be tailored to our business, common sense regulations. And I think the industry has done a great job on the lobbying front. They've had two big successes in you know, Virginia and Indiana in the past few weeks. And those legislations in those states have been enacted and will, be, um, will become law, well, they're law now, but will go into effect very soon, basically say that daily fantasy sports has some issues that need to be addressed. For example, 
they don't want kids playing. People under the age of 18 should not be playing daily fantasy sports. So once this legislation um, becomes effective, the fantasy sports companies will have to take really serious procedures to make sure people under age don't play. They'll have to take steps to address problem players. People who have a proclivity to get addicted to this type of thing are gonna be able to self-exclude themselves from their sites. And the other thing that the legislation will address head on, which is a key issue to the industry, is this idea of insider trade, insider play, if you will, and also will eliminate the possibility of athletes participating in fantasy sports on games in which they're a participant. Um, I think Zane touched on the idea before. One of the biggest concerns, certainly under, under federal law, but also under state law, is that there's not manipulation, that there's not um, the opportunity for criminals um, mafia type to get involved in um, sports, sports contests to influence them and create an unfair outcome. The legislation that, legislations that these companies, the industry broadly has really promulgated and really pushed for will address all of those issues and allow the industry to move forward in hopefully a, you know, in a, in a very um, effective but in also a safe manner for players and uh, for the community generally. Although given the size of given the size of the businesses themselves and the various states involved, it, it's hard to imagine how you don't run up against all of those various issues. And I guess Zane, I'm thinking about your statement that you know the federal government is going to wait and see, sort of watch and see what happens. But realistically, you know, is this something that uh, that you you can assume can just be regulated by the states without people then running afoul of some of those various federal statutes that you talked about. Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of our gambling prosecutions, I mean, the driving statute usually is uh, Title 18 United States Code, Section 1955, which makes it unlawful uh, to run an illegal gambling business. And it has really three elements. First, it violates the business violates state law. So that gets into the whole context of what's going on in the states, what's going on in New York or Illinois or other locations in terms of fantasy sports. Is it illegal or not? And then you look at whether or not it involves five or more persons who conduct, finance, manage, supervise, direct, or own all part of the business. And then you look at whether or not it's in continuous operation for 30 days or in a single day makes more than $2,000. But it really gets back to what's going on in the states. Is that activity illegal or not? And so that's something as a prosecutor you need to sort through before you go ahead and charge it. Now that being said, let's assume that daily fantasy sports is legal. Are there other concerns that may be in place? And it gets back to sort of maybe the insider trading problem. There are other ways to get at that activity. You have wire fraud and whether or not it's a level playing field for the consumers who are now engaged in daily fantasy sports. Do you have insiders who are utilizing information that they have access to that the consumer doesn't and then they're participating in a league where they're able to utilize that information to put themselves in a better advantage? That's gonna be of concern to the federal government, something that the federal government will probably take a look at, whether or not it'll be an investigation, ultimate prosecution, yet to be determined, but that would raise red flags as far as the federal government's concerned. Justin talked about, I don't know why this is Justin, I'll stop. Is it? Okay. One of the things that Justin talked about um, in, in our last panel was sort of the reputational activity of the players. You know, the choices that you make about what you're affiliated with. And here you have something that is, is kind of teetering along with people uh, questioning, is it legal, is it not legal, is it gonna be found to be unlawful, is it gambling, is it not? How do you look at that from the player side and from the professional league side when you talk about endorsements and you know, some of those other issues? What, what are you guys thinking about and keeping your eyes on for that? Yeah, I mean, what, what our eyes are primarily focused on would be the league's gambling policy again. Um, the commissioner, certainly in our sport, um, makes no hesitation to let players know when uh, he thinks that they're running afoul of something that doesn't look right for the game. Um, yeah, exactly. So, so ultimately, 
right now there has been no, the league has not, the NFL has not taken a position on daily fantasy sports and players are actively endorsing it. And so um, while fantasy has been a long, long standing part of football and endorsements and the like, um, daily fantasy just is newer. And as the laws evolve, I think the policies will evolve and, and we'll be following that uh, very closely. Sort of an extension of that, I think, are the, the interaction with the publicity rights laws. Um, and obviously, most of you are probably aware of um, Pierre Garçon's lawsuit against FanDuel, which related to uh, FanDuel's use of Pierre's name in advertising um, associated with the game. Uh, the lawsuit also extended to use of his image, name, number, statistics in the game itself, but there's a string of fantasy cases, CDC and CBS, that um, unfortunately went in, in a direction that doesn't really benefit players protecting their, their, their commercial use of their images. Um, so that taking that piece of the lawsuit together with the, um, the other claim that they were using his, his name to promote the game itself uh, was a reason why players were upset and Pierre was, was upset with them. But he brought them to the table and, and we ultimately helped broker a license that resulted in the landscape we have now with a relationship directly with FanDuel and a settlement of that case. Yeah, I'm sure the business panel will get into this, but there's a lot of money here for everybody involved, right? So there's, there's some real, um, real world economic impacts on this. Um, we we want to try to stay pretty much on time. I wanted to give people in the audience a chance if anybody had a question, our panelists are happy to answer that, uh, failing which we'll just do a quick wrap up. But does anybody have a question on any of the topics we've talked about? Yes, right, right here. Yeah, for those of you in the back, the question was, what role did the state's gaming boards play in this? And I actually think we have someone on one of our later panels who can talk about that too. But David, you want to take that one? Uh, sure. It, it differs from state to state, but in many states, the, the state's gaming board plays a role either in tandem or independent of the AG's office as either a regulator or in an advisory capacity with respect to what the law is. For instance, the reason, the principal reason that FanDuel and DraftKings have not operated in the state of Washington is a formal opinion from the gaming board there indicating that in the state of Washington, DFS is, Ill is illegal. Uh, on the other hand, there's a similar opinion from the gaming board in Michigan which will say something about the authority of that gaming board in that state as compared to Washington, where Michigan's gaming board is given a similar opinion to the opinion given in Washington, but uh, both FanDuel and DraftKings continue to operate in Michigan. Adam, did you want to add something? Sure. I think that was a really excellent question and something that was very unclear even to the industry as of a few months ago. So it's it's a very evolving issue. The one thing I'll just add is that in a lot of states, the state gaming agencies, the state gaming regulators are um, government authorities which have limited roles. And they're only allowed to regulate what their governing statutes say that they can regulate. So in states like that, for example, they may only be allowed to govern lottery, casino gaming, horse, ra um, horse racing. So in those states, the gaming regulator has to take a more passive role. Does that mean that the state AG's offices, the state governor's offices, state legislatures will not go to those regulators who are experts in areas of all things gaming and ask for their at least informal opinion? No, so that sort of thing does happen, but I think it's just important to keep in mind that until legislation comes through that actually gives gaming regulators authority to regulate daily fantasy sports, you'll see them playing a more passive role. And just one example would be Indiana, which recently passed legislation where the State Gaming Commission was actually given authority and told to create a separate sub-agency um, for that. Massachusetts is actually a perfect example of what Adam just said, because Massachusetts, the Gaming Commission in Massachusetts, has no authority with respect to daily fantasy sports. But that didn't stop the Attorney General from asking the Gaming Commission 
to weigh in with its views on daily fancy sports. And in January of this year, they issued a lengthy white paper regarding their views of the legality of daily fancy sports under both federal and state law. Was there another question over here? Did I see? Yes. yes. So we were talking about this earlier. I'm glad you raised it. The question was whether or not the decision yesterday that was announced by DraftKings and FanDuel to suspend daily fantasy sports at the collegiate level, whether that's an admission that uh, some portion of the uh, business doesn't pass muster. So who wants to address that? The people who represent DraftKings and FanDuel, I can predict what they're going to say, but we'll see if I'm right. Well, the, the answer to the question is it's categorically not an admission. I was right. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, that's the short, the short answer. I mean, I think it is, again, representative, emblematic of what I described before as, as the road forward, where there, without making any admissions, there is a recognition of certain realities and a willingness to negotiate in the face of realities and in an attempt to develop productive working relationships with counterparties and prospective business partners. I think also you, you have to wonder whether or not there's some element maybe of PR and sort of given the focus on all of them right now and the legislation, whether people are trying to um, make that a, a little bit, um, a little more palatable. So we have time for one more, yeah. So the question has to do with the legality of sort of the subsidiary um, areas of focus like the exchange of statistical information and whether or not the trafficking of that, especially in interstate commerce, and I was also thinking of the wire transfers and all those, whether or not right. if, the, if the top level is illegal, what does that do down below? Right. Well, that is a key point. I mean, and if you look at the statutes, if you look at the Wire Act and you look at the transportation uh, paraphernalia, it's illegal to send that information via wire or through the mail, et cetera. But what you have to look at, again, is what does state law say? Because it basically says it's illegal, except in those cases where sports wagering or betting is legal, you can't do it. And so you come back to what's going on in the states, and you got the 50 states, and you're trying to figure out kind of what the lay of the land is in terms of the betting and wagering act. That's going to be the driving force in terms of where the federal government decides to investigate and prosecute a case. So we'd love to continue this discussion, but we want to make sure you get to the other panels, and they're all going to be talking about uh, many of these issues from the different perspectives, the business and the legislative perspective. So thank you all very much, and I think we're going to the next panel.